Okay, take three of chapter three. Let's hope that my battery doesn't die and um, everything's going to go according to plan and I'll be able to rattle this off before I get my next call coming in. Okay, types of energy is the title of this one particular uh, chapter in my little story that we're doing here on this project which I'm calling The Online Grimoire was I try and like bring together a lot of ideas associated with all of my thoughts about all of this stuff to date. I mean, you can't find out about this stuff through reading books because those books are written by other people with their own particular ways of doing things and you've got to look at your way of doing things and what you are as a person and make a good assessment of that yourself. All right, but you can have your own experiences and correlate that with other people's writings and sometimes use other people's stuff to help you on your journey. Um, the, uh, the main ex exception to the rule is, of course, the projection of the astral body by Muldoon and Carrington. Okay, so that's just that bit out of the way. It's a very good book. You must study it and, and live by it every single day for a few years until you start having weird experiences. Wonderful. Okay, different types of energy. What are they? I'm thinking about this in terms of energy, I'm not thinking about this in terms of entities. I'll do a thing about entities later on and that's going to be really complicated and challenging to do. But let's just start with energy and types of energy. As in the stuff which is flowing around the universe and is going through your brain and your body right now and the stuff which is in the mountains, in the streams, and in the rivers, and in the crystals and um, the whole flowing thing. All right, but a lot of this you need to know from your own practical point of view and a lot of it I think you need to understand first before you move on to the understanding of things like um, trying to work out what you're going to use it for. One thing I will say is that when I had my experience way back in the 90s when I went down to Glastonbury and I went to the spiritual healing tent and there was a spiritual healer there uh, one of the things she did is place one hand there and one hand there and I could detect that this hand was getting hotter, this hand was getting colder and she was creating a potential difference to push negative energy out of my arms. That was interesting and I described it to her and she said, funnily enough, you know, because <laughs> that's what she was doing, uh, deliberately. Now, what my point here is that she was not doing this just as a result of instruction to my body. Boom, you will drive the negative energy out. No, she was doing this through changing her own energy field and interacting it with mine as a result of changes in her own mind during her prayerful meditative healing state of mind. So this is one of the, another one of the reasons why I object to the way in which magic is taught to young people because it's taught to young people from the point of view of ceremony and moving candles around and that sort of thing whereas that's nothing that's that is like that that is so much of a distraction away from the work that you've got to do that it is useless unless that is the only way in which you can manipulate your energy through hoodwinking yourself, through surrounding yourself, through all of the ritual tools and accessories of a particular cult or culture. Okay? Because if, let's say, you were doing a circle casting, I mean, I've done, I was involved in the pagan movement before, we did lots of circle castings. Sometimes in my states of sensitivity, I could see the blue line where the circle was. Sometimes I could reach out with my hand and touch it like this, like slightly electric, spongy, um, sheet all right uh, so it was it felt a bit more like a membrane which you could push and you could distort and you could push it and pull it but it did feel different when different people put it up okay so that suggests that all of their their particular energy their character who they are as a person went into the energy that they were putting out if what I saw in a spiritual if what I experienced in a spiritual healing environment and what I know people do when they're doing cycle casting. Surely they should be taught how to manage their own energy much better and to control it, not just to think about what flows or what the feelings are when they use certain particular prayer words. And therefore, the way in which they would change their energy would therefore change the nature of the circle. So it's the change of your energy, which I think is most important. Um, and we try and hoodwink ourselves with the energy of visualization or the idea of visualization to do it but it's not specifically visual it's also kind of like tactile it's also like higher energy stuff as well and these are things you've got to experience in order to understand and it takes it takes time
So this is the first point. Learn how to manipulate your own energy field through manipulation of the mind, training yourself with things like strobe light mind machines, which are awesome. Also binaural beat apps on your phone. That can help you to feel different brain waves, but it's not the same as energy. Feeling different brain waves gives you a sense of the lower levels and the higher levels. Yeah, sure it does. But that's only within the brain waves, that's not within the energy field. But it's like trying to, trying to translate those particular feelings into energetic work and to instruct the energy through changing the way in which you're feeling. Um, the thoughts, the moods, the energy, um, the quantity of compassion and empathy you've got. Uh, everything is going to be focused towards what the intention is. So let's say there's someone who's putting up a circle and they understand, I don't know, spirits or whatever in one particular way. They're only going to be putting up the circle to like deal with spirits in that one particular way. Let's say there's another spirit that uh, like, can walk through that particular thing. Just like when I'm in astral body, I can walk through a wall, right? So I think there's lots of things missing from the whole process of circle casting which needs to be um, elaborated upon so that whatever the circle's function is supposed to be, it can be put into the circle so it can do its damn job. Alright, whatever that is. So that should be a part of your self-training. And again, that's you know, takes time, takes energy, and sometimes you can do it, sometimes you can't do it, and that's then there's also the energies associated with sickness, because when my candidiasis was really bad, I could see with my vision that my body was full of this black energy, this dark black energy. So I think it was quite interesting that that's what I can see sometimes. And the spiritual healer that I met in Glastonbury was drawing negative energy out of me that way. So I think that she understood some of the things that was going on there. Uh, then you've got the kind of energy which you can only experience in specific types of holy places and worship environments. And these, and it's not in every single one. It does seem like the, um, uh, the theology, the beliefs, the interpretations of the people and of the, um, the intention to use that space affects what is in it. In places of high worship energy where I've experienced like the Toronto Blessing or I've experienced spiritualism, there is this kind of like um, electric high energy. It can be felt and sometimes it can be sensed as moving like a plasma snake around the floor before it latches onto someone and does them some good or goes into someone and does them some good or whatever it is that it's doing. And it's this like um, golden white stuff and it's very, very strange and very... Um, euphoric. Uh, when I received the Toronto Blessing, I felt for a whole week that my body was full of light. So there is, there is some credence to these things such as blessings and the rest of it having some kind of benefit. But what that is, we still have questions about, not necessarily specific hard and fast answers. Although I have heard of people who have been prayed on in church and have had miraculous healings. I've actually met one. I, he's one of my friends. So that could be that that energy was being effectively used by those who are into, interested in getting into the state of Gnosis, which is of course the same state as the state of prayer when done properly, and was then with love and clear intention delivering the right message to the body and somehow to help it out. These things are not frequent and happen all the time. Didn't happen with me, unfortunately, so that's that. Okay. But that energy seems to exist and it seems to be useful. There's also the energy of places themselves, just like you can walk into a place you've never been to before in your entire life. And you either feel this place feels comfortable or this place doesn't feel welcoming. And that's kind of like the, the energy of the place, the consciousness of the place, the, um, the feelings, the ideas, the ideologies of the place. And your energy, feelings, thoughts, energies, ideologies and all the rest of it not getting on well. So it's not necessarily a spiritually healthy environment for you to be in if it doesn't feel welcoming like that. But then there's other places which are uh, often those which are used for healing, not hospitals, strangely enough, but healing environments where people go for spiritual healing, which often feel much more warm and whole and balancing and cozy and everything's on an even level and it feels different. 
So the way in which a place is used and the people in it and the intentions of the people in it will affect the energy of the place and whether it's going to relate well to you psychologically or not. That also seems to be the case for fields, meadows, woodlands, um, bridges over streams and all kinds of other things. They've all got this, this, the, an emotionality. And it's not based upon visual perception and associations because you can literally go in there um, blindfolded and you will feel it if you are at that time open in a certain particular way. So places seem to have a consciousness. Uh, what that can be used for, difficult to say. The fact that places have a consciousness gives some kind of credence to forms of uh, the more superstitious psychic defense, like um, burying crystals around your property or uh, growing certain particular type of hedgerows and that sort of thing to ward off negative energy. It's not necessarily warding off bad luck, as people would say in like more primitive times when people are hoping that it's going to be about luck, luck, luck. It's a question of pushing away bad energy, which could basically be bad for you, in theory, hypothetically, but it does seem to have some credence to a certain extent. Then there's the energy field of the individual. Sometimes you can go to a church if you're in a prayerful state, and like there's a preacher standing there, whopping great duck egg blue aura all around them, like spectacular. You're, oh, right, that's there, and that can happen sometimes with not so much with people that you've got an intellectual relationship with, like your close friends, um, but maybe family members who you like but are very easy to get on with, um, and other people who are quite happy to be open and naturally have their, their energy more receptive to be read. Some are much easier to read, some are much not, some, some are not. Some people, they just, you can feel their, their energy is closed up. No, no I'm not having anything to do with you. you know, there's, there's an energetic defense there. It's not just in their character, their personality, or their mentality. It's an actual energetic defense which can sometimes be felt. The energy of a person is also strange because uh, crystals do seem to interact with it. I did some meditation with the clear quartz crystal on my orange chakra, which is just uh, four finger widths below the navel. And uh, after a period of time, I felt this explosion of energy throughout the body. Um, and it turned out then that the orange chakra also is supposed to rule over the flow of energy in the body, so maybe you're sorting something out to do with my energy lines. I don't know. It's just me reporting an experience to you. Then there's the energy of trees, which are very complicated cr creatures anyway, because they act electrostatically with nature, with the earth, and with the sky. Uh, sometimes you can perceive energy flowing off the top of them, and also there's lots of energy around the trunk as well, which can be felt sometimes. It can feel uh, sticky like the sap, it can feel verdant. May time is great for, for you to experience the, that, that verdant energy of trees when it's like really, really, really alive. And like you can sit with your back to the tree and you can like go into your meditation into the tree and take something from it and also give something back to it. There can be an energy exchange, there can be like an uh, energetic con uh, conversation going on there. Then there's the energies of individuals attacking other individuals on a more brutish level. I mentioned that brief briefly in the text on the previous video. Uh, sometimes an individual can, you know, really lay into you uh, by their thoughts, their feelings, their words. And these are different forms of psychic attack stroke defense, which people deploy. Barbara and Brennan spoke of these attached to, attached to various different uh, psychological mentalities. And my life experience with dealing with a wide variety of different people with psychological mentalities demonstrates that there is a certain quantity of credence to the aura changing shape for the purposes of psychological and spiritual uh, attack and defense and exchange. This appears to be true and accurate. The writings of Barbara and Brennan are good, even though they're a bit 1990s New Age. Okay. Also, there's the energy associated with uh, woods. I know that they're within the pagan community. They speak about the powers of woods. I don't think it's anywhere near as direct or precise or uh, specific or powerful or in terms of what they can do as like crystals. Okay, crystal healing has some credence to it. To a certain extent, obviously, if I'm really, really sick, I'm not going to go to a crystal healer. I'm going to go straight to A&E. I'm going to go straight to the doctors. I'm, you know, I'll do it the normal way. But then once, once I've taken their medicine from them, I'll then come back and do other healing things on myself if I want to. Okay, that's the way in which I would do it. 
Then there's also celestial energy and terrestrial energy, which have different forms of character associated with them. As you practice these things in meditation, you can then start to use them in different ways. Celestial energy has its own very, very, very it feels fine, it feels light. It's not the same as when you're meditating to go up and up and up and up and up to try and have ascension and try and like really open up your crown chakra and your third eye chakra and your throat chakra so that you can then hear and see weird shit and trying to go into a gamma state and you're trying to like rise the planes. It's not that kind of energy, but it has its own character. So going up into the stars, up into the, just outside of the atmosphere in your meditation can be a, quite a curious experience. So can going down into the depths of the earth in your meditation and feeling the lava and the rocks and the, and the intensity of the depths of the structure of the earth, which has its own energy, character and personality. It's also a question of grounding, it's a question of uh, ascending and, bring, and you can bring these two things back together again, suck it in, you know, just like draw these things in prior to sending it out. That's a school of thought, which again seems to be beneficial. Then there's the energy of intention for the purposes of affecting other people. I had two experiences when I was in college. One I had myself, one was reported to me by a friend of mine who also happened to be a chaos magician. The one I had was I knew this guy who was uh, about, uh, was a bit, bit younger than me, uh, and he was even more of a chronic alcoholic than I was in my student days. And I thought, this, this has got to stop. So I thought, I know what, I'll give him a dream just, just for the heck of it. Didn't tell him I was going to do it, never told him I did it. And the dream was that I met him in the dance hall, I grabbed him by the lapels of his jacket and I said, you've got to work harder, and that's it. About like nine months later at Christmas time, I was going out for a drink with him and he just says to this friend of mine, uh, you know, I had a really weird dream, you know, and it, you know, and it met me in the dance hall, we grabbed my lapels of my jacket and he shouted, you must work harder. Cure, that was so weird, that was. See what I mean? And the one that my friend reported is that he'd done a circle casting and he'd sat down and he had um, a candle going, he had some knives, knives in the flame, so he was allegedly sending fire and steel to his you know, person who was trying to affect it with the dream. And then uh, he created the dream and gave it to that person and then they reported back the very same dream the very next day. Okay, so you can interact with consciousness with consciousness. So if you can, through your meditation and raising energy and sending energy, have an intention to affect someone's dreams and carry a message and carry a narrative and carry a story, and that can then affect another person in their dreams, it might be therefore hypothetically possible for the effective operation of remote spiritual healing and remote Reiki healing. Provided, of course, the intention of the individual, um, sculpted by compassion and other like really positive intentions, and also with a good understanding of how the body operates and the kind of instructions the body requires, could then deliver the right kind of energy to another human being, which could therefore have some kind of positive hypothetical benefits when it comes to health and healing, but then would have to get into a discussion of radionics and the witness sample and getting the witness sample right and accurate and how that connects with the traditions of the, you know, the voodoo doll sort of thing. And in what ways we could actually apply maybe a bit of semi-scientific thoughts to uh, the development of a witness sample based upon what I understand about quantum entanglement via my experience with Spooky 2 and of course the Buchanan radionics, radionics unit. Now the sending of energy thing is what's most interesting because if you think back to that experience which I had when I did my, uh, have my weird dreams about the future, the prophetic dreams which then inspired me to do divination, that came about as a result of something which I'd worked out was a, uh, you know, the same method as spoken of by AC in his theory and practice, as well as other sources too. What I did was I just like, you know, I was a teenage kid, I was in my bedroom, I was just like, no one else was in the house, I was chanting diddly 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 and doing my little chants, now I'm hammering okay, I think it was and I would carry on doing it just for fun. And I thought to myself, whilst I was, I was doing it, well, maybe I could make a wish at the end of it, still chanting, still thinking it through, and I thought to myself, well, what could that wish be? I'm like, during the chanting, during this 10 minutes worth of chanting, getting a little bit more energetic, a little bit more lively, a little bit more fun, you know? 
uh, you know, I was sculpting the idea of what it could be, and then bam, at the end of it, I made the wish. I wish to see glimpses of the future in my dreams. But at the moment I made the wish, it felt like whew, there was an explosion of etheric energy from my body. This is what Crowley was talking about. He says that when the magician is chanting or doing their invocations peacefully, then all is well. But there is a moment which he called the consummation between man and God, in which there is an explosion of spiritual energy from the individual. So I was doing that in my teens, like about many years before I'd even read the book by AC. That's obviously very strange in its own right. But it's the energy that we want to talk about there, because this is where it starts to get interesting. This is the, this is the bit that you're interested in. The raising of energy, creation of energy, um, directing of energy and energy with a uh, sufficient and appropriate defined intent once it has been raised and delivered. But then there's also an intellectual debate there as to how you're going through the process of getting your intention right, how you're going through the process of making sure you're refining everything to the right point, whereby you've got sufficient precision of definition of what it is you're trying to create, what you're trying to affect, who you're trying to affect, and how you're trying to affect them. And also the method to uh, make sure that that result could actually happen in their lives. And that's where it starts to get a bit weird because there's still like many unknowns there. But taking into account that the energy is there, I mean, there's, there's the energy of crystals, there's the energy of wood, there's the energy of, of stones and metal. There's the energy of places, there's the energy of individuals, there's the various different levels, layers of the aura, which are real because I've seen some of them before, I've seen some of my own, I've seen some of uh, other people's. There's the energy of holy places. All of these things have a very real energy, but you can't do anything with it until you can tangibly connect with it. You can you know, tangibly experience it. And that's why practicing with your opening up, practicing with the opening up of the chakras, practicing the raising, rising of the planes, as AC called it, which is actually ascension theology going back to the times of Enoch in the Bible. Doing these things was what helps you to open up. Doing these things is what helps you to engage with the rest of the world and reality. And the state of mind in which we do it is a prayerful, tranquil, meditative state, usually. There are some times when we're trying to establish communication with um, a lower spiritual world or a higher spiritual world, in which case the intention and the focus and the direction of your energy is feels different because you're looking at the world from a different point of view. You're looking at the world of, um, I'm going up to the um, Hall of Elders, or I'm going down to the level of the Dark Elves, or whatever it is. And those have different forms of feelings, you know, we don't know whether there are any Dark Elves, we don't know what's really up there. All we have are weird experiences. And also the folk mythology which has taught us to think in certain ways of which you will have some inside yourself because you're a human being, you've picked up information from here, there, and everywhere. What are the actual properties of the energy? The different types of energy has different types of properties because of what you feel. You have to think about uh, asking the experience. I mean, again, if I can think back to my school days, we had this time, this, uh, the very first day of science class, I think it was. Uh, we had this thing called the exhibition in which we were shown different forms of physical materials and we were asked to look at them as if for the first time, you know, a cube of aluminium. What is it? Is it warm or cold to the touch? Uh, how heavy is it? If you had a, if it, what are its properties when it's thin, like aluminium foil? What are its properties when it's thicker? Uh, um, how, how much can you stretch it? How much can you bend it? Uh, and all these things. So then you can work out what you could use aluminium for in engineering. Okay. But you've got to look at the forces as if, like, for the first time. For a lot of you it will be, it just like suddenly happens spontaneously and you won't really understand what it's all about. And for others of you, you will have picked up so many doctors and doctrines and all the rest of it 
that that may have affected your perception of what you're seeing, so you may end up seeing things through the vision of what you've already been reading. Sometimes it's because what you've been reading is true, and sometimes it's because what you've been reading has been adjusting your mind, and you have to work out through the level of clarity of perception that you're getting as to which one it is. And that requires introspection and intellectual humility. Right? Intellectual arrogance is, ah, oh, this proves it. Well, it lends some credence, but it doesn't prove. Okay, Science itself, proper physical science, with all of its statistical analysis, only shows you what is most likely to be true under some particular circumstances. Okay, that's, that's what science does. And so we build up the body of knowledge, which is what is sub subsequently believed to be real over time, to the present day where we think, oh, this is the, you know, we're, we're here, we're now, we've progressed, you know, we're fine. But let's say in another 500 years we won't be. You know, we'll be looked at as being a bunch of primitive little monkeys with stupid ideas. Then there's the energy which is associated with um, divination and psychic perception. Divination using the pendulum is very different than divination using things like tarot and runes and crystals and the rest of it because you're relying upon your mind in a different way. If you were to start all of your training with mindfulness, you'll be getting much more of a sensitivity to your own mind. So that could then provide you with a useful set of perspectives for doubting. But you'd also have to practice the idiomotor stuff rather a lot, you know, getting the, holding the pendulum in the right way and asking, you know, programming yourself so that there's movement in particular ways under particular circumstances. And divination with the stick pad method used in radionics is, has similarities. The energy that you're picking up with dowsing depends upon what you're focusing on. Depends upon how you feel the energy, how you feel the depths that you can go to, um, different types of things. I mean, the people who use pendulums to find water, um, it looks to me as though they're extending um, some aspect of their aura in a particular direction, and it's he's, they've um, trained themselves, they've programmed themselves to be able to be sensitive to particular things, which then comes through their subconscious mind and then comes out in the dowsing pendulum or dowsing rods. So it's up to the individual to work out what they're looking for. Just like if my house is a mess, which it was before I cleaned and tidied, and I needed to look for something, I would get a good clear image of it in my mind as to what I'm looking for, or I'd even say the thing, scissors, 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 where is the scissors, you know, that sort of thing. Because I'm building up in my mind's eye an image of what the scissors are, and, and then I'm looking for and then my mind is then looking for them. But if you're doing that like spiritually in a prayerful meditative state of mind, you're tranquil, you're open, and you know what you're looking for, and you've been practicing for years with a pendulum, you can then do that on like an energetic level instead, instead of on the level of cognition and optical perception, using your eyes, basically. Then there's the specific different energies of regions within the body. There is the, the, the seven main chakras, there's also the spleen chakra. Uh, there's also the energy which can come out of your hands, some people call them hand chakras. I don't necessarily know if that's specifically a chakra or not, but a lot of energy can be sent through the palms of the hands itself as well as through the fingertips. Essentially there appears to be the energy everywhere, uh, and that does connect with what Alphonse Louis Constant said, you know, the astral life uh, toils everywhere, fructifying matter with life or fortifying matter with life, something along those lines. It's the energy all around us is somehow important to life. If the, if the energy could be cut off, the individual would like get sick and, and like not be very well. That's the hypothesis. Whether that's true or not, again, we have to, you know, you'd have to work that out for yourself. It is said that a lot of disease is created by imbalances of the energy lines. So maybe there's ways of balancing energy in the body through the acupuncture, acupressure methods, which can then actually help out. Uh, visualizing the various different chakras, opening them, providing them with love and healing. That could possibly be useful to you. Uh, again, it's not the same as going to A&E. If you need to go to A&E, you go to A&E, you know, your emergency room. Uh, if you need to go to the doctors, you go to the doctors and so on and so forth. But for your own practice at home, it's quite good to work with chakras anyway because it's a healthy thing to do for mind and body and soul and being. 
but also the energy of the chakras themselves relate to different aspects of life. So if like your physical life is a mess, then maybe that will affect your red chakra somehow. You know, that's, that, that's, there's a connection there. And the various different seven chakras affect, uh, are to do with different levels of being and to do with different levels of your experience of reality as a material person. It does actually seem to have some credence. That should give you something to work with in terms of the various different types of energy that there are in the world. But that's like energy, that's not entities. And that's going to be a bit, and we have to be really, like, really, really brave to do something on entities. But, you know, that's, that's going to have to be the next chapter. Uh, and then we'll have to think about trying to put it all together in some kind of cohesive way and ways in which you could then think about attempting to develop strange experiences. If you haven't yet read Explaining the Unexplained by Isink and Sargent, then I would strongly advise you get yourself a copy, because that's from the parapsychological point of view and is therefore quite good. Speak to you in a bit. Bye for now.